It probably comes as no surprise that some of the villains from Batman Beyond took inspiration from classic Batman villains, but there were some characters that were entirely new creations made specifically for the show. Characters like Curare, the mute world's deadliest assassin, the Earth Mover, a love letter to classic horror films, and Shriek, the man who could manipulate sound waves to devastating effect. But there's another memorable original villain that we're going to talk about today, one that left a lasting impact on some of the people that watched Batman Beyond. Let's talk about Ink. This video is brought to you by WePrint Miniatures, an independent retailer with over 3,000 different miniature models to choose from. To get 10% off your first order or a recurring mystery box subscription, head over to WePrintMiniatures.com slash Serum Lake and make sure the discount code Serum Lake, all one word, is applied at the checkout. Now on with the video. The origins of Ink can be traced back to the first day that the creative team started work on Batman Beyond. She was one of the first characters to be designed during those early creative and chaotic days of the show. I've done a whole video or two that covered the making of Batman Beyond so go watch that if you haven't already. But the quick summary is that the creative team were essentially ordered to stop working on Superman and the new Batman adventures and get to work on a new kid friendly show starring a teenage Batman. And those first episodes needed to be ready ASAP. The idea of a science fiction heavy futuristic show inspired by Blade Runner and Akira was embraced by producer Glenn Murakami, who invigorated the rest of the creative team with his enthusiasm. Without any scripts, the team got to work on doodling ideas for villains, exploring areas that they had never really gone to in other Batman cartoons. The team had one mission, create brand new characters, don't just do Two-Face Beyond make something original. One of the first to be designed was James Tucker's Ink. When asked by Bruce Timm who the character was, Tucker responded, I don't know, she's just this weird globby character, and christened her Ink. From here, the writers would take the character designs and flesh out their backstories and motivations. Ink was immediately identified as a futuristic version of Clayface, except instead of being a grotesque gay mud monster, Ink was more sultry and fluid. She's not a shapeshifter in the same way that Clayface is, while Clayface could impersonate people and pretend to be a normal person, Ink could only really alter her shape. She could form blades out of her arms or become a puddle, for instance, but she couldn't really pretend to be someone else, uh, other than Batman thanks to his black costume. Even in her human form, Ink's skin is purple she can't easily hide who she is. Ink clearly takes some inspiration from the Marvel Comics villains The Sandman, who also can't impersonate people and can change his form, and shares a weakness to water. And she physically resembles the Venom symbiote. She has a gloopy, viscous quality to her, but there's an odd sensuality that clearly resonates with some viewers. Despite being an amorphous blob much of the time, when she stands still, she takes a clearly feminine form with an exaggerated hourglass figure. She is very flirtatious at times, using her sexuality as a weapon. When she embraces Batman, it's not out of lust, but as a threat she's going to chew him up and spit him out. In terms of her backstory, Ink is introduced in the third episode of Batman Beyond, Blackout, as a saboteur for hire. She has been brought in by the villainous Derek Powers to take out his rivals at Fox Tekka, who are competing to build a government space station. We don't get a formal glimpse into her backstory. She's mysterious. All we know about her is what Bruce was able to bring up on the back computer. The results of a mutagenic experiment, the details of which are unknown. She doesn't even have a picture on file. Ink is the first superpowered villain that the new Batman Terry McGuinness faces, and she almost ends his life. In their first encounter, Ink completely dominates Batman and probably could have killed him there and then. The fact that she didn't indicate that she's not a cold-blooded murderer, she's a stealthy saboteur that just wants to get the job done. That is until the job becomes killing Batman and his accomplice. Ink plays up on her sexuality. When she attempts to suffocate Batman, she goes in for a kiss before forcing herself down his throat, which is a not at all subtle sexual reference. She absolutely relishes the power she has over people. She's not some tragic figure looking to restore her humanity. She relishes every moment of her fluid existence. Based on the comments of my other Batman Beyond videos, this scene had a curious effect on people. For some, it was horrific and traumatizing, so much so that they can't even watch it now some 25 years later. And yet for others, it caused an awakening within them. And I really don't know what to say about that. After being defeated by the two Batmen, Ink is put on ice, literally, and held in a cryogenics lab. We see more of this in the episode Disappearing Ink, where one of the janitors at the facility, named Aaron, becomes besotted with her, confessing his love to her frozen 
frozen body. After he's fired for acting inappropriately towards Ink, Aaron sabotages the cryogenic container, allowing her to break free. However, the cryostasis has damaged her DNA and she is unable to return to her human looking form. With Aaron's help, Ink is able to steal some mutagen and restore her abilities. All he wants in exchange is to become like her. Maybe then people will respect him, and maybe Ink will reciprocate his feelings. Ink, of course, is repulsed by how clingy and desperate Aaron is. When she has to pretend to be his girlfriend while dressed in a comically large hat and coat to hide from the police, Aaron takes the role-playing a little bit too far, which angers Ink. She has no interest in him as a person, and only sees him as a means to an end. The thing I love most about this episode, however, isn't the love story between Aaron and Ink. It's the way that when Ink captures Batman and tells Bruce Wayne to come to their location or she'll kill him, the OG Batman turns up in a massive suit of power armor. We're told earlier in the episode that Batman had experimented with this armor in the past, but it put too much strain on his heart, so he had to abandon it. However, when the new Batman's life is at risk, OG Batman doesn't hesitate for a moment to risk his own life to save him. And I cannot put into words the glee I feel when I hear the original Batman theme being played in the rock style of Batman Beyond. Batman Beyond had an absolutely killer soundtrack, especially the Ink episodes, but hearing Shirley Walker's composition in a brand new style is thrilling. I'm going to link to that track in the little info button in the top right corner, so go listen to it when you get the chance. To finish up talking about disappearing Ink, it comes as no surprise when Ink betrays Aaron, feeding him only half of the necessary components to turn him into something like her. Aaron is left as a sagging, warped figure waddling around like some sort of plastic seal that has been cooked in the microwave. That doesn't mean that he's defenseless, however, as he confronts Ink and attempt to get the rest of his treatment. This distraction allows the Batmen to defeat Ink by smashing the windows and letting the rain in, causing her to dissolve and wash away. And we don't see Ink again in the show until the third season. However, in the Batman Beyond tie-in comics, written by series writer Hilary J. Bader, we are shown what happened to her after she was washed away. As we saw during the episode, Ink's DNA had been severely damaged by her time in cryostasis, and getting drenched in rainwater practically destroyed her. For a time, she was incapable of maintaining her form at all, until she was experimented on by a scientist who'd brought her back, in exchange for her doing his bidding. Ink was essentially fitted with a shock collar that would go off every time she disobeyed, effectively making her this man's slave. Ink would deliberately catch the attention of Batman, asking him to help her, stating that death would be preferable to the miserable existence she was living through. Batman was able to trace Ink after she left a small piece of herself behind. This small piece was desperate to reunite with her, so it acted as a homing beacon of sorts. In the battle with the scientist, Ink was severely wounded and seemingly burnt to a crisp. However, that would not be her end. No, she would return in the second issue of the second volume of Batman Beyond. By this point, Ink was so weak that she could not maintain her physical form for very long and had to attach herself to people in order to get around. She was capable of taking control of people for a short time, leaving them in an amnesiac state after she departed, which is a neat callback to the Venom symbiote that she was partially inspired by. Ink's aim at this point is to restore her humanity. She's clearly had enough of existing as little more than a sentient pool of goop and wants to be done with the whole thing, even if there is a chance that the treatment might kill her. While the treatment seems to be successful initially, a short time later Ink would revert back to her inky state, but with full control of her body again, which, as far as she was concerned, was a win. You don't have to read these comics to get the complete picture of Ink. Frankly, they take Ink as she was in the show, change her powers, and then put her back in exactly the same position she was in at the end of Disappearing Ink, with her powers restored. But they are enjoyable, and I recommend that fans read them. They are included in the recently released Batman Beyond Compendium, which you should read if you are a fan of the show. Ink would next appear in the Season 3 episode Inkling, where we get the best look at Ink's backstory and motivations for becoming the monster that she was. We learn that Ink had a daughter, Deanna Clay, I see what they did there. That she had given up for adoption years ago. Ink took the money she had earned spying on and murdering people and put it in a trust fund for Deanna. However, Deanna clearly had a problem with money, living an unsustainable, lavish lifestyle. It's clear that Deanna has her issues. Issues perhaps relating to the fact that she was abandoned at birth by her mother and refuses to live within her means. After being double-crossed by a client, the injured Ink goes to Deanna to seek help securing more mutagen to stabilize her condition. Ink would explain to her daughter that she had come from extreme poverty and was willing to do absolutely anything to get out. When she fell pregnant, she knew that she couldn't give Deanna the kind of life she deserved, and so she gave her up for adoption. Deanna plays the part of the doting daughter doing everything she can for her mother, but it's all a pretense to get access to her bank account. 
Deanna sabotages the healing mutagen, lacing it with a solvent that would destroy Ink's body. While Deanna is confident that this is the end of Ink and helps herself to her mother's savings, Batman is less confident and he warns her that he has seen Ink come back from worse. The episode ends with Deanna quaking in fear and a shadow of a tree twists into the shape of an angry eye, letting us know that Ink will return. And when she did come back, she didn't really have a significant role. In The Call Part 1, she takes a hostage in a park that turns out to be Superman and he makes short work of her, turning her into paste. She would also make an appearance in the Justice League Unlimited episode Epilogue as a member of the Iniquity Collective in Terry's Dream Sequences. And yes, you heard me right, those black and white segments aren't flashbacks. They take place entirely inside Terry's head. They're what he thinks he's going to say and do after he ends his conversation with Amanda Waller. Note that they're in ultra widescreen, black and white, and each segment ends with a word that neatly transitions into the conversation Terry is currently having with Amanda Waller. Note that the actual flashbacks to when Bruce was Batman and comforted Ace in her dying moments are in full screen and in colour. And that's it for Ink in the DCAU cartoons. Ink would appear in the mainline DC Comics continuity Batman Beyond comic books, but they're not the same continuity as the animated series. There is one issue of note, Batman Beyond Volume 4, Number 8, written by Adam Beechin, that shows Ink's origins. It's worth noting that Beechin had written Justice League Unlimited tie-in comics, so he does have a connection to the DCAU, but there are a few things in this comic book that don't quite fit with the cartoon's chronology. We're shown that Ink grew up in a Middle Eastern country plagued by civil war. Her family had to drop everything they owned and flee for their lives to a refugee camp. Along the way, her mother would be killed and she would be taken from her father by human traffickers, where she endured unspeakable abuse. When she was brought to Gotham City, she managed to escape and was taken in by a shelter for the homeless where she discovered she was pregnant. A group of scientists would scour these homeless shelters looking for volunteers to take part in experiments with promises of wealth and prosperity. Ink was all too willing to participate despite the impact it could have on her unborn daughter. When her daughter was born and was healthy, Ink realized that this was not the life she wanted her child to have. And so she left her at a church, confident that whatever life she was going to have would be infinitely better than living on the streets with her. So far, most of this is just the backstory she recounted in Inkling, just embellished a little bit with some of the real world horrors that this place people experience. It's genuinely depressing to hear of desperate people being exploited by greedy scum, forcing them into a life of slavery. It shouldn't be happening now, never mind the futuristic world of Batman Beyond. But the one thing that doesn't quite match is this page where Ink says she revealed her identity to Deanna when she was old enough. We can see Deanna as a student in school having a very negative reaction to her mother. Now, this isn't what happened in the show. Ink didn't reveal herself until she absolutely had to when Deanna was already an adult, because Ink was adamant that Deanna's life would be better without her. Still, that minor gripe aside, it does give us a clearer look into the motivations of Ink. There aren't very many villainous mothers in Batman's rogues gallery partly because mothers have a revered position in society, and it's interesting to see what drove her to throw away her humanity. Frankly, to me, it's completely understandable why she would reject humanity and empower herself to become a deadly weapon that could never be hurt again, in theory. Ink does appear in some of the other Batman Beyond comics, like the Batman Beyond 2.0 story where she teams up with Ten from the Royal Flush Gang to steal Two-Face's coin for some reason that evades me right now, as well as the mostly forgettable Batman Beyond Rebirth era comics. None of these comics have any connection to the people that worked on the show, so I find them easy to disregard. Ink also made an appearance in Tom King's recent Batman Catwoman miniseries as an enemy of the Batwoman of the future, Helena Wayne. She only appeared on two pages and is more of a nod towards fans of the show, without bringing anything substantial to the table. Still, it was nice to see her. Arguably, Ink is the Batman of tomorrow's greatest villain. She clearly has a lot of fans, including some people that are a bit too into her, if you know what I mean, and it would be great to see this character explored some more in the future. Okay, that's it for this week's essay. If you liked the video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, tell all your friends about me. You know how YouTube works. If you really enjoyed the video and have the means, please consider making use of the thanks button to send a buck or two my way, because every little helps. I offer channel memberships for $1.99 a month. This will get you early access to my weekly video essay, priority responses to your comments, members-only videos, like the one where I unbox this massive Mondo Manbat action figure, custom emojis, and an icon on your profile indicating that you're one of my people. Next time, I'll be looking at the personification of organized crime in Gotham City, Rupert Thorne, and how the creative team on Batman the Animated Series were forbidden from talking about the Mafia. Hope to see you then.